Today, we're so happy we have Jameson Seabury and Charlotte Engelbrecht with us. They're both clinical research coordinators at the University of Rochester Center for Health and Technology. Their research experience has been with the um, Chet Outcomes Division, led by Dr. Charles Keatwell, which has a focus on developing patient-centered and responsive clinical outcome measures for use in clinical trials. Today, they're gonna to be giving us an overview of the research going on at Chet and at their division, and they'll be talking about the development of a new uh, outcome measure for Parkinson's disease and how this will impact future Parkinson's disease research. Thank you, Jameson and Charlotte, for being here today. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. Can everyone hear me okay? Great, I'm gonna go ahead and pull up my slides here. All right, so good afternoon. Um, thank you to everyone for tuning in today. It's a pleasure to be here with you at the PMD Alliance webinar series. And the title of our presentation today is a new outcome measure in Parkinson's disease, focusing on the research participants perspective. So the overall topic that we're gonna be covering today is first off, why is it so important that the patient or participant perspective is incorporated into research studies and how can we accomplish this? And so this is a huge topic of interest for my research team. And in a moment, um, we're gonna be introducing ourselves and our organization um, to kind of give you a big picture perspective of how we go about thinking about this issue and really tackling this in Parkinson's disease. So today you're gonna to be hearing lots about this concept of emphasizing the research participants perspective. And you're also gonna hear about some of my team's recent work to develop a new outcome measure for PD and how we went about doing that. Uh, so we're very happy to be here uh, discussing this important topic with you. And I really hope that this webinar helps to shape your perspective on the participants role in research and some of the tools that we need to make our clinical trials in PD successful. So to introduce myself, my name is Jamison Seabury, and I'm a clinical research coordinator at the Center for Health and Technology, or CHET, at the University of Rochester. And so just a little bit about me, I graduated from the University of Rochester in 2020. I have a microbiology background, um, and I joined CHET really with an interest in learning about neuroscience and gaining some experience with clinical research. And I've been in this, in this role for three years now, um, and in the fall, I'll be transitioning to a PhD student here at the U of R. And I'll let Charlotte go ahead and introduce herself. Yep. So my name is Charlotte Ingebrecht. I'm also a clinical research coordinator um, for CHET on the outcomes team. Uh, I received a BS in biology and I also double minored in chemistry and English at Hobart and Lincoln Colleges in uh, Geneva, New York. Um, and I have been with CHET now for about eight months. Um, and I'm really excited to be here and having my first uh, like research experience before I was working in more of a clinic background. So I'm, I'm happy to be here and happy to share with you today. Thank you. Great. So CHET is an academic research organization at the University of Rochester. Um, and we have this longstanding history of conducting research um, in neurological conditions with Parkinson's being a major focus. Um, so Charlotte, Charlotte and I work specifically with the CHET Outcomes Unit, and really our team's mission is to develop highly sensitive and responsive outcome measures for various um, scientific communities, really to facilitate therapeutic development and assessment. And so while at CHET, we've been able to work closely on the development of a new outcome measure for Parkinson's disease, um, which is now being assessed in a longitudinal study that's funded by the Michael J. Fox Foundation. And so in light of these new developments and this new study that's being started, um, my team thought what a great time to connect with members of the community, share with them some of the work that we've been doing in Parkinson's and look to engage members of our community however we can. So here's the agenda for today. Um, I'm gonna take you through an overview of the organization that we represent, the Center for Health and Technology or CHET. Um, we're going to talk about the importance of patient-centered outcomes and why there's a need to improve our outcomes for the PD research community. 
I'll then be talking about a new patient reported outcome measure that was developed by my research team called the Parkinson's Disease Health Index, or the PD High, as we call it. Um, we're going to go over some critical aspects of that outcome measure, how we developed it, and why it demonstrates validity. And we'll also look at some performance data related to that. We're then going to be introducing our new um, or the current study called Leopard PD. And this is a longitudinal survey study that's assessing the new Parkinson's disease health index over the course of two years. And then lastly, we're gonna leave you with some information about how you can engage with CHET, um, how you can get involved with the research that's going on at our organization. Um, you can learn more about our organization if you're interested. Um, and then we'll open it up for Q&A and we look forward to hearing from the audience and answering any of the questions that you might have. So as I mentioned, the Center for Health and Technology, or CHET, is an academic research organization at the University of Rochester. And so we're comprised of these various divisions that you see listed here um, that all play a critical role in the various types of research that we conduct. And I'm not going to go too much into detail here, but I um, thought I would just say a little bit about each of these critical divisions. So we have the analytics team. Um, this group is looking to take uh, large scale clinical trial data and boil it down into predicting models of disease progression in PD and in other neurological um, conditions. And this information is really critical um, for the efficient planning and conduct of clinical trials. We have the Health Policy Equity and Inclusion Division. Um, this division is looking to improve upon equity and diversity in clinical care and in research. Um, so we really look forward to collaborating with this division and improving upon the ways that we're conducting our studies. We also have the Clinical Trials Coordination Center and the Clinical Material Services Unit. Um, these groups are critical to conducting multi-center clinical trials, and these have been historically across a range of neurological diseases. Um, we also have CHET Innovation. This group is looking to implement novel technology into clinical trials to assess participant health. And this can include wearables, um, smartphone apps, devices, um, really with the objective of trying to decentralize clinical research or bring it away from the clinic and into people's homes. And so this, um, what this does is kind of allow for more participant-centered evaluation of health and eliminate some of the key barriers for folks um, being able to participate in research. And then lastly, we have the CHET Outcomes Team. I have saved this for last because as I mentioned, this is the division that we represent. And I'm gonna be taking you through um, really a detailed overview of our focus and some of the outcomes work that we've done in PD. So I want to start off very general here um, to kind of orient everyone to our topic today and what our focus is. So when we say clinical outcomes, what exactly are we talking about? What does this mean? Um, so the Food and Drug Administration, or FDA, defines a clinical outcome as really any way um, to measure how a participant feels or functions. And there are so several different ways that this can be done. Um, ultimately, it really depends on the population that's being studied as far as what's available and what's an appropriate measure of health to use during a clinical trial. And so listed here are some of the various types of outcome measures um, that are commonly used. So we have the direct patient report or a patient reported outcome measure, which is often abbreviated a PRO, um, where a patient or a participant themselves can report on their own health. Uh, we also have observer reported. Um, our group also likes to call them caregiver reported. Um, so this could be a parent, a spouse, a family member, um, or really anyone who is able to report on the participant's health. And these types of outcome measures are very useful in communities where um, the participant is unable to report for themselves, um, such as in pediatric populations. There's also clinician reported. So the clinician is assessing a patient and reporting on the patient's health. And then we also have performance-based outcome measures. And these are assessments of a specific task performed by the participant that are designed to indicate their functional abilities or their physical performance. And so, for example, in PD, um, this might include the timed up and go test. 
And so there's advantages and disadvantages to each of these, um, but ultimately it really depends on the clinical trial and what's being studied as far as the outcome measures that are selected and used in the research study. But really the purpose of this slide here is to kind of provide you with a brief overview of what's out there as far as um, clinical outcome measures. And maybe you have direct experience with one or multiple of these, um, but our outcomes group is really focused in on the development of number one and number two here, the patient report and the observer reported or the caregiver report. So why is this our focus? Why um, are patient and caregiver reported outcome measures advantageous in research? And so patient and caregiver reported outcome measures in general are surveys or questionnaires that are designed to be completed by the patient themselves or by a caregiver. Um, and this is really to obtain a detailed picture of a person's health or quality of life. And these types of outcome measures, when they're designed properly, um, are supported by the FDA for use in clinical trials and even in support of drug labeling claims. And the patient and caregiver reported outcome measures that are developed by our group are designed to measure the symptoms and areas of health that are most important to participants and also um, pick up on small but clinically important changes in health. So for example, in a longitudinal study, um, when these questionnaires are administered at different time points, are designed to pick up on um, clinically meaningful change. And it's been shown that at times these outcome measures can be more responsive than performance measures. Um, so in the past, clinical trials have failed because the primary endpoint was maybe a functional assessment that just wasn't responsive enough to detect clinically meaningful change. Um, so it's really crucial for a clinical trial to be successful, um, to have an outcome measure that can detect those small but clinically meaningful changes. And the outcome measures that we develop actually have the potential to increase clinical trial efficiency. And the way that they can do that is reduce sample size requirements um, and also reduce clinical trial costs. And then another important thing that I wanna note is that um, these outcome measures can actually allow for greater inclusion of research participants in our clinical trials. So this is an example outside of Parkinson's disease, um, but in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, which is an, um, another area that our group has conducted research in, the six minute walk test actually excludes um, non-ambulatory individuals from the clinical trials. Um, so selecting an endpoint that is fit for individuals with a broad range of functional abilities is very important um, for increased access to the research. So I've talked a little bit about the importance of patient and caregiver reported outcomes. Um, so the next question here is how do we actually go about designing these? Um, how do we know what are the best questions to ask in a survey? And then how do we turn those survey responses into an accurate reflection of someone's health? And so I won't go too much into detail um, with this here, but really the short answer is we have to rely on lots of participant data to build these outcome measures. And we have to adhere to a very comprehensive set of guidelines and standards that the FDA um, outlines for us. And so this is an image of the title page um, here of the FDA document that we are frequently consulting with and that we must adhere to in the development process of these outcome measures. And so this guidance basically says that there are very specific qualities that go into a good outcome measure and make it appropriate for use in a clinical trial. And so some of those criteria are listed here in this figure. And what I'm gonna be talking about soon is showing you how we went about developing a new patient reported outcome or PRO for Parkinson's disease and how the outcome measure complies with each of these specific criteria. So just to, to name a few, um, the questions have to be meaningful to individuals with PD. Um, they have to meet very specific statistical criteria, which we're able to derive from our data. Um, the questions can't be redundant, although we need to make sure that it's comprehensive and asking all of the important questions. Um, so that can be a challenge. We kind of have to ride that line of ensuring that the outcome is comprehensive while not being um, super repetitive. 
any outcome measure can't be um, excessively burdensome for someone to complete. So if we're asking folks to spend an excessive amount of time answering questions, um, that's just not feasible for a clinical trial or for the participant. So um, the outcome measure has to be succinct and it has to be accepted by the participants who it's designed for. And so before I jump into that, um, I do just wanna say a little bit about our team that's dedicated to developing these outcome measures. Um, many of them are on this call right now, um, but we do have a fantastic interdisciplinary team that consists of neurologists, study coordinators, um, project managers, statisticians, uh, really who all make this work possible. Um, but most importantly, the research participants that dedicate their time to the research, um, really thousands of individuals have participated in the research that's been conducted through chat throughout the, the years and really has enabled the advancement of knowledge of better outcome measures and therapeutic development in PD. Um, so really wanna emphasize that it takes a village here and it takes um, a wide range of knowledge and expertise with much of that coming from the participants themselves. And so CHET Outcomes has a huge focus on PD, as I mentioned, um, but our group has actually developed disease-specific outcome measures for numerous populations. And so in total, we've developed um, and validated over 130 outcome measures um, for numerous scientific communities. And so these outcome measures have been translated and validated into languages around the world, hence why you see um, the globe here. And so global access to the outcome measures um, is really a big part and a big focus of what we do. Um, it allows these outcome measures to be implemented in multinational studies and clinical trials, um, which is really a huge um, advantage. And so listed here are some of the ways that the outcome measures are most commonly used, although um, there are some other uses as well. Um, but we look to partner with academic centers that might be initiating a clinical trial or an observational study. Uh, we do have industry look to input the outcome measures into their clinical trials. As I mentioned, these outcome measures are used to support drug labeling claims, so industry is a key stakeholder here. And oftentimes we also have foundations um, implement the outcome measures in their own studies and in um, patient registries. And listed here are some of the communities that we have developed um, new outcome measures for. The main focus has been in neurological disease, mainly in movement disorders and in neuromuscular disease. Although we have uh, created outcome measures for other communities as well, you'll see that we have lung cancer and Crohn's disease listed here. And the reasoning behind this is that the issue of access to valid and responsive outcome measures is not just an issue affected by Parkinson's, um, not just neurological disease communities. It's actually a topic of interest across many different fields and scientific communities. So our group really looks to identify uh, gaps that we see in clinical trial tools um, across a number of populations and really look to bridge those gaps. Okay, so what I wanted to show is um, what's currently out there as far as patient reported outcome measures in Parkinson's disease and kind of talk about why the need for a new one. And so listed here are some of the most commonly used patient reported outcomes that have been implemented um, historically in PD clinical trials. And each of them are really unique um, in the types of questions that they ask, um, how they're asked, and also the response options that they use. And so I'm not gonna to talk too much in detail about you know, a specific one of these, um, but most of these were developed specific, specifically for Parkinson's. Um, some of them focus on very particular symptomatic domains, um, such as these single domain scales. Uh, many of these were designed to obtain an overall assessment or a global assessment of PD health, but the Parkinson's disease health index or the PD high is a new patient reported outcome or PRO 
that our group developed, and it was designed to add some very specific benefits to the research and clinical care community, um, which I will highlight here in a moment. So what's unique about the PD high? Um, and I'll take you through some of these. So we developed this outcome measure using large scale participant data. Um, so instead of relying on a small group of clinicians or experts um, or relying on a literature review, we actually asked individuals with PD themselves, what are the symptoms and symptomatic domains that are most important to you? And we incorporated those into the PD high. We also designed it in adherence with FDA guidelines, as I mentioned, which is very important for its use in a clinical trial. The PD high is also scored in a way that weighs symptom questions according to their participant identified importance. Um, so this really allows for a more accurate picture of someone's health. And what many outcome measures do, and this can be an issue at times, is to score symptoms equally. So for example, I experience fatigue, and I experienced difficulty walking. And what we found is to score those um, symptoms equally isn't really um, the most appropriate or accurate way to score those symptoms. Um, so what we need is a more sophisticated scoring algorithm that really takes into account that importance of that um, symptom. Another aspect of the PD high is that it uses response options that have been tested and validated in hundreds of research participants um, so this really allows us to know that um, the response options are, have been highly reviewed, that people are comfortable using the response options, that they're clear, and that they really um, apply to a very broad audience. And the PDI assesses overall health as well as in 13 symptomatic domains, and I'll be sharing these with you here in a moment. Um, but I do want to also emphasize that we found that sleep impairment and fatigue are extremely important to individuals with PD in our national study. Um, so the PD high includes several questions about those symptomatic domains, really to ensure that those concepts are adequately covered in a clinical trial. So in developing a new outcome measure, we really have these two main questions that are um, kind of critical to our process. And so that is one, what are the symptoms and areas of health that are most important to adults with PD? And two, how can we use this information to develop a new outcome measure that can be used in a clinical trial or in clinical care? And this is really to demonstrate that this is a multi-step process that requires input from as many adults with PD as possible at different checkpoints in this process. And I'll be taking you through um, some of these key steps and findings from this work. So the first step is qualitative interviews with adults with PD. And what this involves is a member of our study team sitting one-on-one -on -one and asking about the daily life and the symptoms experienced by someone with Parkinson's. And so this is a really useful step in research. It gives us the ability to let the participant guide that conversation. And we get some really valuable insight that you couldn't get from, um, for example, taking objective measures or just having someone complete a survey. And the purpose is really to understand the wide net of symptoms that affect adults with PD. And we use those relevant quotes um, that we obtained during the interviews to identify the symptoms of importance. So 20 adults with PD provided nearly 3,000 direct quotes during this process um, regarding their experience with PD. And we boiled those down into potential symptoms of importance to be included in a larger cross-sectional study. So the next step is we have hundreds of potential symptoms. Um, we know that they're important to our sample of 20 adults with PD but how important are they to a much larger sample? So we conducted a cross-sectional study involving participants all over the country who responded to demographics questions and also rated how each of the symptoms mentioned during these interviews impacts their life. Sorry about that. I might've 
my monitor might have disconnected. Can everyone still see my screen or? I can see your screen. I see your screen saver. Oh, sorry about that. You're good. Technology is only great when it works. Exactly. <laughs> there we go. Okay, can you see in full? Perfect. Full? Yep. Perfect. Yep. Okay. Um, so in the cross-sectional study, we were looking to obtain um, the prevalence and relative importance of these various symptoms and really explore which symptoms rose to the top as far as their prevalence and importance to a larger um, national sample of adults with PD. And these symptom questions span 14 different domains, each of them representing a distinct symptomatic theme. And so this is kind of to reiterate our process here. Um, our initial interviews yielded direct quotes. These quotes mention specific symptoms. And then these symptoms are sorted into unique symptomatic themes by content. And the purpose of the cross-sectional study is really to capture the perspectives of as many adults with PD as possible, um, really to identify which symptoms are most prevalent and impactful, which will then provide us with information about what will be best fit to include in the outcome measure. So we had 404 adults with PD uh, complete our cross-sectional survey study. And so this was a collaborative effort. We partnered with multiple foundations. We had PMD Alliance, the Michael J. Fox Foundation, Davis Finney Foundation, um, as well as our internal U of R clinic support groups and our internal U of R registry. And so our sample represented 45 US states. Um, participants were mostly retired, as you can see, although we did, did have representation from those um, employed full-time or part-time, those on disability or not working or other. The average age of our sample was 68 years um, and the average year since diagnosis was 6.6 .6 years. And we found that 92% of our sample was taking medication for their PD and 25% indicated that um, they were genetically positive for a mutation or risk factor associated with PD. And so what did our study of 404 participants really show? Um, so indicated here is the prevalence and average impact of the symptomatic themes that we assessed in our cross-sectional study. So the average impact is essentially a measure of symptom severity. Um, a zero means that the symptom occurs but is not impacting people's lives, while a four means the symptom is impacting people's lives severely. So in interestingly, we found that the most common symptomatic themes in our sample cohort um, were impaired sleep and daytime sleepiness, fatigue, impaired mobility and ambulation, and activity impairment. And the most impactful ones, so the, mo the ones most um, severely impacting people's lives were fatigue, impaired sleep and daytime sleepiness, pain and activity impairment. So it was very interesting how we found that fatigue and sleep impairment um, were identified both as most common and most impactful in our sample. Um, so this was kind of a key finding here. And now we're going to take a look at the individual symptoms and how participants rated those. So as far as the individual symptoms, um, we found that the most common were fear of disease progression. And then again, we see these fatigue symptoms rising to the very top. So we have feeling tired, physical fatigue, and decreased energy. And then the ones that were most impactful, um, we see back pain. Um, loss of physical intimacy, difficulty using ladders, and constipation. And so I do just want to note that this is summary statistics from our data. And of course, um, we want to acknowledge that each individual is unique and what's important to them and what their um, priorities are. But we're really looking at this from a whole samples perspective.
So we have a number of symptoms that we have identified that are prevalent and impactful to folks with PD. And the next step was to develop the first version of the clinical outcome measure or the Parkinson's disease health index or the PD high. So we took those most um, prevalent and impactful symptom questions and we eliminated um, those that were found to be redundant. And so the first version of the PD high contained 108 symptom questions representing 13 different domains or symptomatic themes. So what I wanted to show here is what do the questions in the PD high actually look like? Um, so here are a few examples from our communication bank. And you can see that we list um, symptom questions that we identified from our prior study. And then we ask the participant to indicate how it affects their life. So I wanna highlight a couple of points about why um, it's designed this way. So instead of having um, you know, multiple wordy questions, we really just have one question and that is how much does the following impact your life now? And this is designed to be clear and straightforward and to be administered throughout the entire um, questionnaire. And then as far as the response options, um, you know, sometimes you might see a numeric scale. So rate the symptom from zero to 10. And um, this can occasionally bring in some challenges. So for example, what does a two mean? Or what is the difference between a two and a three or a three and a four? Um, so the responses are intended to be direct. Um, we want to know how it's impacting someone's life. And this gives us a really concrete idea of um, how the symptom is impacting someone and really provides meaning behind the differences between each of these different options. So we have the first version of the PD high. And the next question that we look to ask is, is it usable? Is it relevant to participants? And is it easy to complete? Is this feasible, feasible to put in a trial? And so these are questions that we actually look to ask the participants directly. Um, so during this process, we interviewed 15 adults with PD after they completed the PD high. And we asked them to provide their thoughts and feedback on the outcome measure. And so based on the feedback that we received, um, we modified the outcome measure, we deleted or edited questions that folks identified as unclear or um, vague. And really the purpose was to optimize the outcome measure and ensure that it's accepted by individuals with PD um, who will be using it in future research. And then the next step in our process is more of a statistical one, but it's ensuring that these questions are reliable. Um, so we wanna delete any symptom questions that can change significantly over a very short period of time. So we selected a 14 day period. And if we saw questions that were unreliable, so maybe for example, um, my frustration is really low on one day, but then, then the next day it's affecting me a lot. Uh, these kinds of questions aren't going to give us a very accurate representation of symptomatic burden. And so this step is really to ensure that we're selecting the questions that are most likely to respond in a clinical trial. So this is one of the essential criteria for these questions, and we use data to ensure that they adhere to this. So after modifications were made based on participant feedback and then um, the test retest reliability, we arrived at the final version of the PD high outcome measure. And the PD high consists of 96 symptom questions across 13 um, symptomatic themes. And so we recorded the time to complete and participants were able to complete this in an average of 14 minutes. Although we do expect this time to vary um, when it's implemented in a clinical trial. And so importantly, the PD high contains the most prevalent and important symptoms in PD as, as determined through our cross-sectional study. And it also adheres to the many criteria that the FDA has outlined um, for use in a clinical trial. And so shown here in this figure is exactly what's measured by the PD high. So each of these symptomatic domains that are listed, um, there are 13 of them, 
spanning physical, social, emotional health. And each of them consists of anywhere from one to 18 more specific or more granular symptom questions. Um, and when completed altogether, this provides a comprehensive assessment of overall PD health. So these uh, subskills can be taken individually, but altogether really are providing that overall assessment. And so one of the ways uh, that we can test um, kind of the initial validity of the PD high is to look at scores in specific subgroups of our sample population. And so here are the different subgroups that we looked at. Um, listed here, we have duration of Parkinson's disease. Um, so we looked at those above versus below the mean year since diagnosis. We looked at those by employment status, so those on disability versus those not. And then we also looked at the duration of select symptoms. So um, for example, we had tremor and ambulatory impairment, and we separated those by those who had zero to five years of duration of that symptom versus greater than five years. And so what we did was compare the mean PD high scores in these different groups really to see if the outcome measure can differentiate between these subgroups that we would expect to differ as far as their presentation of symptoms. Um, so this graph is depicting PD high scores uh, in our sample of 404 adults of PD. And a score of zero on the PD high represents no disease burden, while a score of 100 represents the maximum level of disease burden. And as indicated through this analysis, participants with a longer duration of disease, so those above the mean year since diagnosis, scored significantly higher on the PD high than those with a shorter duration. Those whose employment status was on disability uh, scored higher than those not on disability. And then those with a longer duration of select symptoms, so tremor and ambulatory impairment, uh, scored higher on the PD high than those with a shorter duration of these select symptoms. So really what this is uh, providing is initial evidence of the sensitivity of the PD high in being able to detect clinically significant changes. However, additional testing really is needed for us to understand the performance of the PD high to prepare um, for its use in future clinical trials. So I'm now gonna pass it off to Charlotte, who's going to talk about our current study and provide you with some information about how you can engage with chat. Thank you, Jameson. Um, so we, we have this new outcome measure in PD that Jameson talked about, and we know that it's important and accepted by adults uh, with PD, and we also know that it uh, meets very specific regulatory criteria. So the next question is, how does this new PRO perform over time? And what that is asking is, if someone with Parkinson's completes the PD high at multiple time points, how does it exactly track Parkinson's disease over time? And if there are changes in the scores, what changes can we consider clinically important? So uh, for example, if there is a clinical trial that's introducing some new intervention or therapy, uh, will a change in five points on the PD high mean that the intervention is successful or will it be 10 points and so forth? So that's exactly what we're looking to find out and uh, why we're conducting the current study through chat. So this study is titled Leopard PD, and it stands for you know, Longitudinal Endpoint Optimization to Provide an Assessment of um, Relevant Drugs in Parkinson's Disease, which is a very long-winded name, but uh, we do love our acronyms, so uh, we call it Leopard PD. And what we really want to do is assess various patient-reported outcomes um, known as PROs in PD. So this includes the PD high and two other PROs. And we are assessing them in a two-year long longitudinal nat natural history study. And then in addition to assessing the PROs, uh, we are obtaining this natural history data in PD to um, also allow us to determine which demographic, uh, disease-specific, and treatment-specific characteristics are associated with either like a faster or slower disease progression. And this is truly a collaborative effort. Uh, so we're partnering with multiple PD foundations and organizations. 
uh, because we really need as much participation and engagement from the community as possible. And that's why we're here today. So speaking of who is eligible, uh, any adult, so 18 years or older, and uh, with the diagnosis of PD, and this can be self-reported or a clinical diagnosis. And then in addition, we have English speaking. So currently the surveys are provided in English. We do hope to extend into other languages soon, but um, as of now, it's, it's in English. And then next, what does this study involve? So we'll be asking folks to complete um, the online surveys at baseline, which that just means the first time that you take the survey. And then every six months after that for two years. So it'll be a total of five different time points throughout the study. And what we'll be looking to do is examine the performance of the PD high over time as a measure of Parkinson's disease. Uh, we'll also collect natural history data, like I mentioned before, and um, obtain the participants preferences using the PD high compared to the other PROs in the study. <clears throat> and so we have, a, here is the, in the next slide, the layout of the timeline. So, and the, the various forms that we're asking people to complete at each time point. So we'll be asking demographic questions and then the three PROs at every time point. And these PROs are the PD high, which is our instrument, the MDS, UP, DRS, patient reported components, and um, then finally the NeuroQual. And uh, some examples of the symptom domains that PROs will, will be asking will include um, physical health, social health, and, and emotional health, just to give you an idea of what kind of topics the surveys will cover. And then we also will have a survey preference form uh, that you would take um, only at baseline, and that is to see what you thought of the three patient reported outcome measures, which one was the easiest to complete out of the three, or which one had the most relevant questions and so forth. And then there's also an impression of change form, which will ask how your, your symptoms and your health um, have changed over the last six months, or if there's any changes from the last time that you took your assessment. And there's a lot of ways that you can engage with us. So um, here is a, a nice picture of our offices at Saunders Research Building. Uh, pointed out here is Jameson's office and my office is directly behind her. So um, in case you come looking for us, you now know where to find us. Um, but to go further into the engagement, we have something called Project Brain Health. And this is a registry that you can sign up and be informed about studies that are going on in PD. And this would be for U of R and other institutions as well. And when you sign up, you can actually filter what types of studies that you're interested in and can be routinely notified about them as they occur. So specifically, how does Project Brain Health work? There is a consent form about joining the registry, and then you provide your information as directed. And then there's the online form, which is what I was just talking about where you can indicate your study preferences and what you wish to be notified about. And then um, you can hear from us or the other study members at a future date when we're recruiting participants for a specific study. And I just want to clarify that um, this does not sign you up for any study. It only signs you up to receive an email when a study is going on and when they're actively looking for participants. And then after you receive an email, you can decide whether or not you'd like to participate. It's not obligatory. So um, you don't have to participate if you do not wish to, it just simply notifies you. And that brings me into today, so the current Leopard study. We have um, a link that can be shared through the chat, which I believe um, Kelly or Eden can share out. Um, and the Leopard link directs you to our study information letter. You can uh, take a look and then decide whether or not you'd like to self-enroll. Uh, the only thing it requires for you is um, the email for us to send us your surveys. And you can also provide your phone number if you want to have a phone call reminder, but that's completely optional. We can also do email reminders. Um, and then you can also reach out to our study team at any time. We're always happy to talk about the research that's going on, answer any questions or receive any feedback. So I want to thank you so much for your time today. We're very grateful for your attention and we'll be happy to answer any of your questions that you might have. So um, thank you again. Thank you both. Um, 
So I want people, I want to encourage people to put questions in the chat, but I have questions because I always have questions. Um, so you did kind of answer if somebody does sign up, um, they'll start getting surveys via email. And so this is sort of, they, they don't have to reach out to you. You're going to reach out to them. You're going to follow up. Um, when someone gets a survey, how long do they have to complete it? Is it like, you know, within a week of receipt? Can you tell me a little bit more about that when they sign up for the study? Uh, Jameson, did you want to answer that? Or? Sure, yeah. So um, if you click the link, you'll receive a, a comprehensive study information letter. And then if you do decide to sign up, you'll provide your email and then automatically complete your baseline assessment. So then that's kind of start the clock. So then exactly six months after that, you will receive an email with your next assessment. And so that actually just comes from our system that's automated um, and you'll receive up to three email reminders to do so. If you do provide your uh, phone number, as Charlotte mentioned, um, that basically, basically just says the study team could call you to remind you if you wanted to do that. As we mentioned, that's optional, um, but that's really how that process goes every six months and um, that'll go on from baseline to two years from now. Someone asked, are you including people who have had DBS surgery? And if so, are you differentiating pre and post DBS PD high scores? That's a great question. So yes, we are including folks who've had DBS and we'll actually collect that information. Um, so the demographics and clinical um, questionnaire form will ask about um, your history of DBS. <laughs> And we will be looking at um, that data. Once we analyze that, we'll be kind of, you know, separating out between those who have received DBS versus those not and taking a look at, at differences in those folks um, really as part of our, um, our data analysis. So that's a great question. One question I just, as you were, you were speaking, um, you talked about relevant quotes from the intake interview. Can you share any of those? Because I was sort of like, ooh, I'm curious as to what other people had to say. Yeah, so during our, our interview process, uh, what we do is we, uh, we conduct these interviews and they're really in a semi-structured format. So we have a, a set of questions that we go through, but really we look for that participant to kind of guide that conversation. And we really want to know what's most important to you. And we want that participant to really talk about their own experience. And so when we say relevant quotes, that's kind of um, a term that we use in our analysis is, is that quote mentioning a specific symptom? So that's how we can go and identify what we call as a relevant quote. Um, you know, sometimes in our interviews, we get chatting and, you know, we might be talking about other things as well. So we kind of consider those relevant quotes uh, part of the analysis that goes into our study. And um, we really received a ton of information from that process. Really, we were looking to capture all potential symptoms of importance um, from participants, and that really drove our, our next um, step in the cross-sectional study. Another question, because I was really, I mean, and I don't know if people want to come off mute and discuss, but I was really surprised by um, the one slide where you were kind of talking about um, the impairment and most of the impairments were either two or less. And so I was kind of in my head, I'm going, like you talked about how fatigue was a big one. I was a little surprised that the mobility and ambulation wasn't up there more. And so then I just, I kind of wondered, is that because things maybe get averaged out? And so you have the people who say, this doesn't affect me at all versus those who really are like, this affects me horribly. Because um, I was just, I was really kind of surprised that most of them were not, I mean, I'm not trying to be like a negative Nelly here, but I would have thought, you know, like I, I've heard from um, a lot of people, for example, they call it the three o'clock wall that with the fatigue, they hit a wall at 3 p.m. and it's like, they're done for the day. Like nothing else is really gonna get done. And so I, in my head, I'm going, well, that would have been, <laughs> Nancy's giving me a thumbs up. Um, that to me would be extremely debilitating. So then when I saw that, I was like, huh, most of these are really, it's like it's acknowledged that it's affecting you, but not to the extent that I might have thought. Am I the only person who was kind of surprised by that? Can you maybe explain, like, is it just maybe the way it's scored or something? Because that really did surprise me. 
Yeah, that's an interesting comment. And so can you, I, I did pull up that same slide too, just so that we're all kind of looking at the, um, the slide that you're referring to. Is it up on the screen or? No, you want to share your screen? Oh, let me go ahead and share it just so that we all have it up. Yes, that's it. Yeah, here, so that's, yeah, that's a really um, interesting comment there. So we have this zero to four point scale for the average impact. And when I listed those, you know, those most impactful um, themes, I think, as you're mentioning. And so really what we're looking at is this blue bar here. Um, and you can see that. So we had, you know, th this fatigue rose to the top, but really very slightly. And so maybe that that could have been something else that I mentioned here. Um, so what you can see is, you know, in, in other studies that we've run, you know, maybe we have one theme that's kind of surpassing. Um, others, but really you see a kind of a close um, assessment of these different themes, which I think maybe provides some more insight there. Um, so you can see fatigue in mobility and ambulation, you know, fatigue is just slightly rated as more impactful, but not by much. So I think that kind of provides some more insight there um, regarding that mobility and ambulation. It just it was one of those things because when when you explained how the scale was done and it was like this doesn't affect me at all so it's like I can see on this that the prevalence was there people were like yes this affects me but I was kind of taking like the one might be slightly versus moderately versus you know that I was like I'm really surprised that there weren't more threes and fours. And so then I was kind of in my head, I'm going, well, maybe it's just offset by the people who are like, well, yeah, I have this. But then I also couldn't help but wonder if it was just the natural like, oh, I'm just going to play this down a little bit. It's not as big of a deal. I just I was very the slide to me was really like, wow, I wasn't thinking this based on what I've always heard. And especially like the ambulation, which I know is a big deal more for care partners, admittedly, like, I'm kind of curious how care partners might rate this and they'd be like, that's a huge deal because this person's barely walking. And, um, but then I also did wonder, um, there's another slide where you talked about, um, I guess it was in the themes and one of those themes was social health. And I wondered what does that cover, I guess, because to me, I, I thought, well, is social health, are you talking about things like your voice, um, because I know that can be a big thing is when um, you start having the hypophonia and you can't speak as loudly, some people kind of stop speaking or when you can't follow the conversation because of cognitive, like I was kind of wondering what does that entail? Yeah, that's a great question. So we had um, a number of social symptoms that came out in our, in our interview process. And then, you know, as we went forward, um, maybe to give you the ones that landed in the, the final outcome measure. So our social bank um, really includes so social role limitations is one of our questions. And then we also ask about disinterest in social activities and then impaired interactions with friends and impaired interactions with family. So those are really the questions that sort of, um, you know, rose to the top as far as importance and then also meeting that statistical criteria as far as building that outcome measure in compliance with FDA recommendations. As researchers, were you surprised by some of the answers that you received? Because you really did tailor this, not on your notions, but on what other people thought. Were you at all surprised as researchers? Like I might have thought something else would have been a bigger deal because I mean, like you said, this was strictly based on what the people reported. That's yeah, I think I think um, maybe especially in our interview process, you know, you you get um, you get to really sit one on one with that participant and um, you hear about some of the important symptoms that maybe you wouldn't think about as a researcher, really getting that personal perspective. Someone I think is a um, just really unique and it. you really hear some things that um, you might not see in the literature, you might not see in, in research. So um, as a researcher, you really appreciate that step, I think, that kind of personal one-on-one -on -one and getting to hear um, that first-person perspective. But then I think another kind of impor important thing to note is, um, so our sample population, you know, we do have to consider some things about, you know, how we recruited and, and who is in the study. 
and we do acknowledge that you know maybe we're capturing folks um, who are on that earlier end because because of the self report and because you know we're mainly reaching out through registries and people who are active in research. Um, so I think that's also a consideration too is kind of looking at you know our sample and how that maybe influenced some of the findings that we saw. And then just to also clarify, um, with the leopard study, is that 14 minutes every six months then? You said it would be about 14 minutes. So on average, um, it's 14 minutes for the PD high, like taking that, but with um, taking the other, like the demo, adding the demographic questions and then taking the other PROs with it, like the MDS and um, UPDRS and NeuroQual, it's on average about 45 minutes for a time point. Um, does anybody else have, although I am happy somebody agreed with me that they were like, I too was surprised by the results. Thank you, Nancy, because I was, I was like, wow, I would have thought a little bit more um, disturbance, if you will. So does anyone else have any other questions? Ms. Jameson and Charlotte have been so wonderful sharing their time today. We're so grateful. Well, thank you for this opportunity. It was really a pleasure to get to participate in this and really grateful to get to be here and speak with you all about our research. Did you want to um, ask a question? Yes, you want to come off mute? There okay. you go. Um, my question has to do also with the surprise at that last slide, but I noticed that 55% of the respondents were female and for male, and we are told that Parkinson's is generally more predominant in men. So I wonder if there's something about the participants you have already looks get Parkinson's, but there are fewer of them in this study. So you cut out there. So uh, we're talking about the difference between males versus females, and why there were slightly more females in the study. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. Um, you raise a, an interesting point there. So, and we've actually seen this in our other studies. We we tend to see, for some reason, slightly more female participation, even when they're, you know, as you mentioned, Parkinson's um, has been uh, found to be to affect men more commonly, and you know, it's it's a phenomenon that we're not. It's really unclear, and we, um, you know, it's might have something to do with where we're recruiting from. So maybe these registries are, are predominantly female. Um, you know, it, there could be a, a number of factors really influencing that, but that's some, it's a really interesting comment that we don't exactly have an answer for and maybe something that we'll tease out more in our, our current study. Thank you. And just to add to that too, um, I think it's important to note when we do caregiver reported um, outcome measures and we look at the demographics of that as well, it's normally female caregivers that are responding to TARC to take place in the um, the study, so we don't have as many male caregivers as well. So I think it's oh, sorry about that. Um, more you know common as from our the other studies that we've done where we have a higher female participation rate than compared to men. Thank you so much for your time today. Before we go, we really encourage everyone to save the chat. We put in some information um, so you can contact Jameson and Charlotte, as well as to get, if you'd like to get involved with Leopard PD, it sounds incredible and pretty much open to everyone. So I think that's just wonderful. I really encourage everyone to get involved. This is really how research moves forward is with people participating. Um, we have a tradition here at PMD Alliance. We ask you to um, our wave of gratitude. Thank you so much. Again, save your chat. If you uh, click on the three dots, that will save your chat. Thanks, everybody.